Why it feels so hard to speak up after narcissistic abuse. Well, a fictional client, we'll call him John, was in a business meeting where there were several higher ups in it. They were discussing how to deal with a competing company who was eating into their market share as the top widget maker in the country. And John thought to himself that his company, we'll call it Widget Pros, make, makes their widgets by hand while their competitor named, we'll call it Widget Willies, uses robots to make theirs. And he thought to himself, hey, why don't we let the public know that? As he thought that, he felt a surge of excitement as he hoped to say this and see everyone's reaction and of, of appreciation and, and admiration. Then he heard a softer voice in himself and that voice started getting a little louder and a little louder. And it was saying things like, you know, it's not that great an idea. They've probably already thought about that and eliminated it. So you'll look like someone who doesn't think things through. Why, who, who are you to speak up in a meeting like this? You need to just keep your mouth shut and just listen. Well, as you can imagine, the excitement he was feeling faded and he was left with a feeling more like spoiled milk um, in his torso, which was sort of a combination of a, a freezing experience and, and self-loathing. Uh, not good. About 10 minutes later in this meeting, though, the highest ranking executive in the meeting exclaimed, I've got it. We make our widgets by hand, right? Well, Widget Willies makes theirs with robots. Who wants a wi widget made by a robot when you could get it made by hand? Let's make sure the public knows that and make it a central part of our marketing campaign. Wow, great idea, everyone else exclaimed. Uh, how'd you come up with that, said another. You know, if that emoji with the person putting their palm to their forehead could happen in real life, John would have used it for sure in that moment. Well, if you can relate to John's experience in this meeting, then you may have survived narcissistic abuse where it was important for you to find reasons to keep yourself muted, even when, or maybe even especially when, you had something very important to say. I think it's moments like the one John had in this example that are outside of the narcissistically abusive relationship that really make this strategy apparent and something that many of those who are trying to recover from narcissistic abuse very much wish they could change. Well, in today's video, I'm going to explain why it can feel so hard to speak up after surviving narcissistic abuse. And if you watch until the end, I'll offer a tool to start challenging the mandate to keep quiet so that you can speak up with your good ideas and then get the credit you deserve. Well, my name is Jay Reed and I'm a licensed psychotherapist in San Francisco, California. And I specialize in helping individuals recover from narcissistic abuse, both in individual therapy and through my online course and community. We take a three-pronged approach to recovery that involves making sense of what happened so that you know you didn't deserve it, gaining distance, whether that's uh, psychological, emotional, or even physical uh, distance from the narcissistic abuser, and living in defiance of the narcissist rules. Today's video falls under the category of living in defiance of the narcissist rules. And if you survive narcissistic abuse from a parent or a partner, you might check out my free ebook on this topic because it explains why someone is selected to be the scapegoat. And it's not because they're so bad, but actually because they're so good. And finally, why none of this sort of treatment by the narcissistic abuser was deserved. The ebook makes clear how the process of narcissistic abuse and the role of the scapegoat survivor is a product of the narcissistic person's psychopathology or, or psychological problems and nothing else. And you can find the link to the ebook in the description below or by clicking here. So why can it feel so hard to speak up after narcissistic abuse? Well, I think there are three reasons. And the first is that censoring yourself can keep the narcissistic abuser from feeling threatened. And why would speaking up threaten the narcissistic abuser? Well, this goes back to how the narcissistic abuser is psychologically organized such that expressions of value from others become something to be squelched rather than appreciated. So a narcissistic individual starts with a core sense of worthlessness and shame about who they are and they find these feelings to be intolerable. So then they cope by unconsciously relocating these very painful feelings about themselves into others and acting towards those others in ways that influence those people to identify with these unwanted feelings. So John, in the example I, I said at the start, had a narcissistically abusive father who would react with this sort of feigned confusion and contempt whenever John shared an idea he had at the dinner table. 
The message his father wanted him to accept was that whatever John thought was useless and stupid. And in therapy with John, it became understood that his father felt this way about himself, but used this tactic to relocate this feeling into John. So that's what the narcissistic person does to evacuate their painful feelings of self-loathing. But then they do some other things to shore up this artificially um, positive concept of themselves. First, they insist that instead of being worthless, they're actually worth more than others. And then next, they feel entitled for others to reflect back this artificially inflated version of themselves. So they need others to serve their psychological functions in two ways to be the receptacle of their own feelings of worthlessness and to reflect back to them their inflated view of themselves. These functions are often sequestered or sort of compartmentalized into different people, which is why people speak so much of one child in a narcissistically abusive family being the scapegoat or one who's blamed for everything and another kid serving as uh, the golden child or the kid who reflects back to the narcissistic parent how special that parent is. In either case, neither kid feels endorsed to know and speak what's really on their minds. Instead, it can feel like they're handed a script from the narcissistic parent and must live their lives as if they're reading from that script. And this script reading is very much an unconscious process. Um, and there's adaptive value for the survivor of such narcissistic abuse of learning to stay quiet and keep one's mouth shut from saying original ideas or perspectives. Because if doing so would have resulted in going off this script from what the narcissistic abuser needed you to, to be, then there's likely going to be hell to pay in the form of punishment and or withdrawal. And, and those can take quite uh, extreme dimensions depending on how severe the narcissistic abuse is. The second reason why it can feel so hard to speak up is that you may be conditioned to expect to feel shame when saying something original or contributing your own ideas. In John's case, the sequence that he experienced over and over again at the dinner table and in other uh, venues with his father was that when he spoke something true and original, and typically for John, it was good uh, about himself or his point of view. He was met with that, you know, what are you talking about reaction from his father. And as I've explained in my three-part video series on shame in recovery from narcissistic abuse, uh, which you can find in the description below or by clicking here, we, we experience shame when we're expecting to be met with connection and instead are met with a hostile disconnection. And I'm using my hands in this way because it's sort of like, here we come wanting to be met, sort of like this. That's the kind of mutual connection. And instead, it's surprised to find them being met with someone who's looking down upon them in a very hostile, contemptuous way. That was exactly what John experienced when he was trying to speak his ideas at the dinner table. And so then later in, in his early adulthood, when he went to speak his own mind in personal and professional settings, he could feel a deep sense of shame emerge that be relieved when he would avoid speaking up. So that's the second reason why it can feel hard is that speaking up involves the or can, can involve a lot of shame that, that simultaneously emerges. And the third reason why it can feel so hard to speak up is that you may have learned to treat yourself the way your narcissistic abuser treated you. In this particular case, if the abuse was committed by a parent. You know, there's a theory in, in psychology or, or psychoanalysis called object relations that in essence says we learn to treat ourselves and others based on the way we were treated by our earliest and most important caregivers. So a relationship to a narcissistic parent and the way they required you to be marginalized, uh, disconnected from yourself, and focused on them most if not all the time can get internalized by treating yourself in a very similar way. And many survivors of, of this type of abuse, you know, find it very difficult just to pay attention to themselves internally because they have had to internalize their narcissistic abuser's attitude towards them. One of the hallmarks of having had to internalize a narcissistically abusive parent is it can be, feel very difficult to pay and sustain attention to oneself. Um, and that's a direct, I think, mirror of the way one was treated by a narcissistic parent, where there is sort of a willful and sustained um, neglect of the child and the child's inner world. And so if that child has to take in the parent and treat 
and therefore treat themselves the way that parent treated them, then a big part of the way they will treat themselves is a need to sort of ignore themselves. Um, so to pay attention to themselves can very much feel wrong in a very deep and core way because it's sort of breaking out of the way they formed an attachment to this parent. As I've said in, in a lot of different ways in, in different videos, to go outside the way you shared a reality with a narcissistically abusive parent can be very, very painful. And uh, the term is dysphoric, sort of confusingly uh, uh, troubling um, and in a very intense way. And, you know, even though the narcissistically, narcissistically abusive parent is difficult and mistreating, uh, it, they offer a sort of relationship. And of course, you know, we always want a good relationship. Next, a bad relationship will do, but at all costs, we want to avoid no relationship. So since speaking up involves acting, paying attention to yourself and acting in a way very different than what would have been permitted in relationship to the narcissistically abusive parent, it can feel very forbidden and prohibited uh, to, to do so in this particular kind of way. A kid is particularly vulnerable to having to internalize a narcissistically abusive parent's attitude towards themselves when there is not a viable alternative to, the, to that narcissistic parent for the kid to attach to. So an enabler parent who essentially excuses him or herself from being someone the kid can depend on can make it so that the kid has to internalize a narcissistically abusive parent's attitude because that's the only relationship afforded to the kid. So what can you do to exercise your right to speak up after narcissistic abuse? Well, first, getting psychological, emotional, and maybe physical distance is a crucial first step. You know, in recovery, it's possible to consider the dangers that you had to avoid by muting yourself as being no longer present. But if your narcissistic abuser is still playing a big role in your life, then this is very hard to do. Next, it can be very useful to cultivate a mindful and compassionate attitude towards the thoughts and feelings that tell you not to speak up on the occasions that you actually really want to. And I've been inspired with examples of this in the um, private Facebook group that accompanies my online course on recovery from narcissistic abuse. On Fridays, I ask members to post moments of progress that have occurred throughout the week. And what constitutes progress is not always something that's objectively positive, but can be a very challenging set of internal experiences, say, during the week. But the progress often involves taking a very compassionate, patient, and supportive attitude um, towards oneself while these difficult feelings uh, and, and thoughts are occurring. And that's really what informs um, this tactic uh, was seeing how powerful, you know, and I think uh, accepting of oneself that that can be, as I've observed that to happen in the, in the Facebook group. And finally, one concrete step that can be taken um, to help to kind of counteract this reflex to kind of stay quiet is to make it a sort of commitment with yourself to speak up, let's say once, twice, three times, whatever you feel comfortable with in the kinds of settings where you're, you might be invited to um, speak your mind, whether it's at business meetings or at the kitchen table with people who are safe enough um, or, or with your friends or whatever it is. And if the goal is just to speak up X amount of times, you know, once or twice, then it's not like every time one speaks up, it's in order to convey something that feels really important. It just kind of exercises the practice of speaking up, even if it's not with something that you think is going to maybe be uh, a major revelation or a big, you know, contribution you're excited about. It just kind of works that muscle of speaking up and I think can make it feel a lot less um, pressure filled. And that kind of normalizing of the process of speaking up can really be helpful in, in it feeling safer uh, to do so in the process of recovery. Well, thank you for tuning in today. I hope you found today's video helpful, you know, particularly if you find yourself, you know, feeling stymied from expressing yourself fully um, in, any, in any dimensions in your life um, if you've survived narcissistic abuse. And I also want to thank you all again for your continued support and um, comments and engagement on this channel. Uh, it's just so fantastic to, to see that each, each week. And I look forward to posting again next Sunday. Take care.